hopes a new mass vaccination hub will combat growing hesitancy among the population to get the jab. Fighting shows no sign of abating in the Gaza Strip as Israeli airstrikes and Hamas rocket fire continue for a ninth day. And police hope to solve one of Australia's most intriguing mysteries and unearth the identity of the Somerton man. Hello, welcome to ABC News. I'm Karina Cavallo. The federal government is staring down critics of a proposed new gas-fired power plant in New South Wales, insisting it will help avoid a power price hike for consumers. In an extraordinary intervention, the government spending $600 million on the plant to help offset the scheduled closure of the Liddell power station. Critics have labelled it a loser project that doesn't stack up. Political reporter Jane Norman joins me now from Canberra. Jane, what's the justification for this investment? Well, Karina, basically the government's worried that when the Liddell coal-fired power station closes down on schedule in two years' time, there's going to be a shortfall of about 1,000 megawatts of energy in the New South Wales power grid. So last year, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, issued an ultimatum of sorts to the private sector, asking private companies to come forward with proposals to effectively fill that shortfall, whether it be through a new uh, baseload power station, through battery storage... Well, month, many months later, the deadline has passed and uh, only one private company came forward with the proposal, but it was a little bit smaller than the capacity the government was after. So today, after sort of all of these warnings and ultimatums, we have confirmation from the federal government that they're going to spend $600 million of taxpayer funds to build this gas-fired power station in Curry Curry in the Hunter Valley uh, to make up at least some of the shortfall left by the closure of of the Liddell power station. Now, it is a really unusual intervention by the Commonwealth into the electricity market. Um, we'll get to it in a moment, but there has been a very mixed reaction today to this news. Um, but it's a slightly different type of power station. It won't be operating um, for, you know, 100% of the time. It's basically to try and stabilise a large amount of solar energy and wind energy that's being produced in the system. Uh, this gas-fired power station will turn on um, when it is needed, when the demand is spiking. So Energy Minister Angus Taylor says it fulfils two objectives. One, to stabilise the electricity grid and two, he says, to put downward pressure on power prices. If we replace the capacity that's being lost from Liddell, uh, then we'll contain prices. If we don't, we'll see prices go up by 30% in the short term and substantially more in the longer term. So it's very clear that a gas generator like this can help to put prices down um, and that is exactly what we want to see, of course. So there's been plenty of reaction, Jane. Talk us through it. Yeah, well, Alan Finkel, Carino, is the former chief scientist. He says it's actually a good idea to have this kind of power plant in New South Wales. It can rapidly fire up, produce power when it's needed. And he said it will help to sort of stabilise, as I was saying, the renewable energy that's being pumped into the system. But a big uh, swathe, really, of environmental groups, green groups, have lashed this proposal. They say that, you know, while gas is a cleaner fuel than coal, it's still a fossil fuel and it's still produces emissions when it's burned. So it's not exactly the kind of project you want to be commissioning if you're on a path to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. There is also a few questions over some of the government's assertions. Um, firstly, it's unclear if the closure of Liddell will indeed leave a 1,000 megawatt capacity um, you know, shortfall. Um, there are some suggestions that the capacity will be much lower than that. Um, and uh, Labor has really questioned if the price private sector didn't want to invest in a new power plant. Why is the, is the government putting taxpayer funds into such a plant? So the uh, Shadow Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen today has called on the government to produce the business case to really assess whether this is indeed good use of taxpayer funds. This is a proposal which Mr Morrison and Mr Taylor must urgently release the business case for. If they're so confident that this stacks up, release the business case to the Australian people. Show the Australian people why our EMO is wrong. Show the Australian people why the Grattan Institute is wrong. Show the Australian people why the experts are wrong. 
Chris Bowen there, Karina, just listing some of the groups today who have come out to really criticise the government's decision to intervene in the market and spend so much money building a new uh, gas-fired power station. OK, Jane Norman reporting there from Canberra. Well, for more on the federal government's plan to build a new gas-fired power station, we're joined by Dr Madeline Taylor, an expert in energy law at the University of Sydney. Dr Madeline Taylor, thank you for your time. Uh, why is this announcement and the federal government's intervention in the market so contentious? Thank you for having me, Karina. There are a number of reasons why this is so contentious. First of all, we pay some of the highest gas prices in the world in Australia and committing to a new gas-fired power plant at a time where the IEA, AEMO and ISB um, have all confirmed that we do not need new gas-fired power plants is really the issue here. So in terms of energy security, we already have battery storage, large-scale renewable energy and other sources to ensure that we have reliability in the grid. And it seems perplexing that we're committing to a new gas-fired power plant when there are calls internationally to wind down such new power plants. Yeah, we'll come to that report from the International Ag Energy Agency in a moment because it is uh, very interesting, the timing of that. Um, you mentioned yeah. their batteries. Tell us a bit more about what the alternatives should be for when Liddell closes. Yes, so a peaking power station, as we just covered there in your report, only ramps up some of the time. So it's there to sort of patch a hole, if you like, in the grid. So this power plant's only going to be online probably around 150 hours per year. Contrast that, of course, to battery storage, which is available year round when commissioned correctly, can ramp up very quickly and effectively. And that's the key alternative here. The other alternative, of course, is green hydrogen, which is not commercially viable as yet, but hopefully will be in a matter of years. And that, again, provides further backup storage. So there are many different options on the market. Renewable electricity, of course, is the cheapest now on the market. And if we're intervening uh, here by putting public money into a gas-fired power plant, the biggest fear that markets have there is that it could be a stranded asset. Yeah, because even the Clean Energy Council today said that grid-scale batteries proposed by the private sector could undermine the viability of this power station even before it's built. That's exactly right. And some economic modelling actually confirms that battery storage en masse is 30% less expensive than a gas-fired power plant. And that's certainly the case in Australia, where we have some of the most expensive gas prices in the world, sometimes up to $17 um, a gigajoule, essentially. So this doesn't make economic sense. The other problem is that this is public money that we're talking about here. So if it's public money, then the public have a vested interest and they deserve to be heard on this. Communities deserve to be heard on this. The Hunter Valley deserves to be heard on this to see whether this is something they would really want long term. Well, on that point, do you think this is politically motivated ahead of this weekend's by-election for the state seat of Upper Hunter? That's a difficult question uh, to, to answer, of course, but it does seem to coincide quite nicely. It's, it's unfortunate it's coincided after the uh, IEA report, as you mentioned, but it does seem that politics and energy policy has been mixed here. And what's important is that energy must be apolitical. It's a public good. It's a human right to clean energy and affordable energy. And I do feel that often the two are conflated. Because the government's argument is that this project will help lower power prices, which is critical for job creating industries. Yes, that's right. However, I mean, the economic modelling shows that it won't lower power prices and it seems that a peaking power plant, which is only in operation some of the time, isn't going to do much to power prices in the way of lowering them. In fact, it may increase them because if it's only available and operating for a certain amount of time, then in order to be economically viable, it needs to charge high prices when it's online. So really, the economic argument just doesn't stack up here. The International Energy Agency, as we mentioned earlier, has just produced this report which found that fossil fuel expansion, so new um, power stations, gas power stations, must end now if the planet is to address the climate crisis. So can Australia reach net zero emissions by 2050 if it follows through with this project? Well, obviously gas is methane, it's a type of greenhouse gas, and if we're committing to new greenfield projects, not only will this be a new gas-fired power plant, but what couples with that is new gas exploration and exploitation in general. 
we need to be winding down new assets in fossil fuels and we need to be investing all of our money now and time and policy into a green shift. It's very difficult to see how we will meet our net zero by 2050 goals internationally if we are investing in this sort of energy. Australia should be a leader in renewable energy. We have some of the sunniest and windiest days uh, per capita in the world. This is a golden opportunity and it seems perplexing as to why we would miss it. Dr Madeline Taylor, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure. To breaking news, the Somerton man has been exhumed. The remains of the unidentified man have been placed inside a coffin, which is being taken away for DNA analysis. Police conducting the exhumation at a gravesite in Adelaide's West Terrace Cemetery found an identification tag confirming the remains were those of the Somerton man, whose body was found on an Adelaide beach 73 years ago. We'll have more on who this mystery man could be with our guest Derek Abbott, who has studied the case closely. He's from the University of Adelaide and we'll speak to him a little later this hour. The federal government says a record 95,000 people have received COVID-19 vaccines in the last 24 hours. More than 3.2 million doses of the vaccine have been administered in Australia in the last three months. The Health Minister Greg Hunt says the figures show the rollout is ramping up despite recent reports of vaccine hesitancy. The biggest source of confidence is Australians seeing other Australians have the vaccine and today we have record numbers of Australians, over 95,000, who in a 24-hour period have been vaccinated. That's the single biggest source of confidence that any Australian can have, looking at their friends and their family, their mum and their dad, their grandma and their grandpa being vaccinated. And uh, the fact uh, that we're seeing that take up, I think, is extremely important. The second thing uh, is we do have a role uh, in terms of uh, our own uh, support the advice of the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisation following the medical advice. Why is it that Australia has zero cases? We've followed the medical advice. What's the medical advice of some of the finest uh, medical leaders in the world? Uh, that we should be vaccinated, that it's safe, that it's effective and that it protects each of us but it also helps protect every one of us. Advertising plays a role and we're always reviewing that to respond to the needs. But also there is uh, appropriate advertising for different cultural and linguistic groups. I was with the Greek community yesterday. Uh, they've said we want to be part of this and uh, uh, the Greek community leaders um, were committed to encouraging their community as are others. So we worked through multiple different channels and then um, the medical community, uh, the media, we all have, have a role uh, to keep that picture that this is part of a uh, you know, a once in a century national task and uh, to be able to do that um, it's a rare privilege for all of us in media, in government, in medicine, in community where each of us can roll up our sleeve and each of us can encourage others to roll up their sleeves. A new mass vaccination centre has opened in Melbourne South East. The Sandown Racecourse facility will begin vaccinating 800 people a day, with capacity expected to increase to 2,500 over time. Victoria now has more than 30 public vaccine centres operating across the state. More than 330,000 doses have been administered in the state, but there are still widespread reports of vaccine hesitancy. It's hoped the centre will boost vaccine uptake in multicultural communities. The thing we're trying to do is make sure we have vaccination sites available to everybody in the community. So this um, centre, which is now in the middle of Springvale, has a really large multicultural um, uh, clients around. So we're really opening up to that, those sort of clients here and we're really hoping that um, we'll be able to encourage them to come and get vaccinated. A man has died at a business north of Adelaide this morning. In a statement, SA Police confirmed the workplace incident at a Waterloo corner business occurred just after 8 o'clock. Circumstances around the death have not been released. However, Safe Work SA and police are investigating. It's the second workplace death in South Australia in three days. Locals say shark sightings are common at this time of year after a man was killed on the New South Wales mid-north coast. Reporter Keely Johnson has more. 
There has been no sign of the shark responsible for yesterday's deadly attack here at Tunkari Beach. Despite efforts by the Department of Primary Industries who have deployed drum lines at the local beaches, they've also been working with surf lifesavers who have deployed a drone and jet skis to search for the shark. What they have found is four juvenile sharks just over two metres in length. They have tagged those sharks and relocated them just about a kilometre and a half off the beach into deeper waters. Earlier today, I spoke to a local young man who arrived at the beach shortly after the shark attack on the 59-year-old man from Northern Beaches. I was in the car park here and I walked up to the break wall and I just seen the man being dragged out of the water. He looked pretty worse for wear. I, I looked at his leg and I saw blood and I instantly figured shark attack. My heart goes out to the family that have lost a life due to sharks. It does happen, it's tragic that it does, but there's not much we can do. We go in their territory and sometimes we pay the price. Beaches from Blackhead to Burgess will remain closed till at least tomorrow afternoon. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau has found a fire on an Antarctic on an Antarctic supply vessel started during a routine fuel transfer. The MPV Everest was about 1,000 nautical miles from Mawson Station when a blaze broke out in its engine room about 90 minutes after a routine fuel transfer began. The fire cut power two and destroyed two inflatable rubber boats. No one was hurt and the ship was escorted to the West Australian port of Fremantle. Still to come on ABC News this evening, a mystery man exhumed in Adelaide, but is it putting authorities any closer to figuring out who he is? Several Asian countries are grappling with dangerous new waves of coronavirus. South Korea has seen hundreds of new cases of major variants of the virus, and Taiwan is experiencing its worst outbreak of COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic. East Asia correspondent Carrington Clark has more from Seoul. Here we are in Seoul, South Korea. It's actually a public holiday today uh, to commemorate the birth of the Buddha, which is why you can see some lanterns uh, displayed behind me. This is one of the main tourist strips in South Korea. And since I've arrived uh, in Seoul in February, this street has mostly been pretty barren, been pretty empty. So th th there are people out today, may not feel like the cases are rising. There are concerns now with widespread variants popping up across the country, but particularly here in Seoul, about how much uh, South Korea is on top of this virus at, the, at this point. There were more than 650 cases recorded in the country yesterday. Um, this is a population of around 50 million people. Now, in saying that, it's been hovering in the 600, 700 range uh, pretty regularly over the last few months, so we're not seeing an explosion. The concern is whether or not the testing is picking up just how widespread the virus is. It is a different situation in Taiwan. While South Korea has learnt in some ways to live with relatively widespread um, transmission of the virus, Taiwan hasn't. Uh, and what we're seeing there is the virus has breached its pretty watertight borders. It's being blamed on a shortened quarantine that we saw in Taiwan. Back in April, they shortened the quarantine for airline crew to only three days. And it appears from that uh, shortened quarantine time, it was a, the virus was able to jump, the British virus uh, variant, I should point out, uh, was able to jump from airline crew into the wider community. And now they're picking up very large numbers, re relatively speaking, uh, within the Taiwanese community. Yesterday, there was more than 250 cases. In the last week, there's been more than 1,000 cases. That's for a population about the size of Australia, around 25 million. Uh, and the, again, the concern there, because testing is not very widespread in Taiwan. They just got used to a situation where the virus was all but eliminated. Um, they're worried that they haven't been able to pick it up. In South Korea, there have been uh, restrictions for a while now about how many people you can have, uh, for example, in your private residence, a maximum of four people when you go to events. In Taiwan, though, they have actually increased the restrictions quite remarkably. Uh, they've actually closed schools now, closed for another week, uh, and we are seeing restrictions on how many people you can have 
uh, and, and things like gyms and uh, other types of entertainment, ve uh, entertainment venues have actually closed. I mean, for most of this pandemic, East Asia was looked to as being uh, well, lauded for being for their ability to keep the virus contained. But it now p appears, unfortunately, that, that Asia is falling behind Europe and particularly North America in how quickly they're rolling out the vaccination program. Uh, South Korea only has around 7% of the population receiving one jab of vaccine so far. In Taiwan, it's around 1%. And since we have seen this outbreak, there has now been a run in Taiwan of people trying to get the vaccine. So they've had to change the way that they were administering it. Up until now, there's been very low demand with not much virus circulating. People have been pretty willing to wait to see what, it ha what happens. Uh, but now they are uh, dealing with a major shortage of vaccine uh, in Taiwan. They're now pleading for help from around the world. Uh, Taiwanese diplomats are in full force, both in North America and Europe, trying to get their hands on this precious vaccine. Uh, but the concern from the public is they've left it too late. The borders have now been breached and it's going to be very difficult to actually get this under control. And you now have this uh, quite high risk race between how quickly can you vaccinate the population versus how quickly these dangerous variants are spreading. Violence between Israel and Palestinian militants is continuing into its ninth day with more airstrikes and rocket fire. Overnight sirens sounded in southern and central Israel in response to the latest barrage of Hamas rockets. Israel says its targeted attacks against Palestinian militants has put their progress and ability to harass Israel back by years. More than 200 people have been killed since the hostilities began, most of them Palestinians. International calls to end the fighting have so far been unsuccessful. And these are live pictures of Gaza as fresh rockets attack the Palestinian territory. It's late morning there, about 20 past 11, with little rest in the bombardment over the last 24 hours. Israeli Defence Forces maintain they're targeting Hamas terrorists who are using civilian buildings for cover. We will have a special program on the Gaza conflict hosted by Stan Grant tomorrow night at 8 o'clock Eastern as calls grow for a ceasefire. Stan will examine the reasons behind the cycle of violence being unleashed in Gaza and southern Israel. So that's at 8 o'clock Eastern tomorrow night on the ABC News Channel or anytime on iview. The Indian Navy has mounted a massive rescue mission for nearly 80 oil workers and crew whose barge sank when a powerful cyclone hit the west coast. The crew sent an SOS on Monday saying the barge had lost control. Naval ships were sent to the area off the coast of Mumbai and rescued more than 180 people. Five ships and surveillance aircraft are continuing to scour the site for those still missing. Cyclone Tawukte has been the most powerful storm to batter India's west coast in two decades. It's killed at least 29 people and forced the evacuation of more than 200,000 residents from their homes in Gujarat. Spain has deployed soldiers to its land border with Morocco, where at least 8,000 migrants have reached an enclave. It's one of two North African areas governed by Spain and has become a prime destination for migrants trying to reach Europe. This was the day Spain sent tanks to its beaches to hold back a human tidal wave. The border with Morocco under strain like never before. Hundreds of troops scrambling to block the final steps to European soil. The pleas and the prayers, they didn't work. So different 24 hours earlier, when the first of 8,000 people simply walked or waded round the border post at low tide. Moroccan officials seemingly did nothing to stop them. Some families took with them what they could, saying they were driven by desperation and the hope of a more prosperous future. Spain's Prime Minister flew in and was welcomed by local officials. He warned this was a significant crisis, not just for Spain, but for Europe. But he was given a furious reception by local residents in Ceuta who feel abandoned and want tougher action. Esta llegada... This surge of irregular migrants represents a serious crisis for Spain and also for Europe. In the name of the Spanish government, I want to convey to all Spaniards, and especially to those living in Sayutu and Melilla, that we will re-establish order in their city and at our borders with the utmost speed. This evening, the main reception centre is overwhelmed. 
even though thousands of new arrivals have already been forced back. Spain says children are being allowed to stay. They now await their fate. But some have seen enough and are now taking their chances, believing a new life is within reach. It's a 70-year mystery that all began with the discovery of an unknown man's body on Adelaide's Somerton Beach in 1948. Theories have flourished about the Somerton man's identity and tonight police have exhumed his remains, hoping to match his DNA with a name. Professor Derek Abbott has played a crucial role in the investigation and he joins me now from Adelaide. Derek Abbott, thank you so much for your time. You've watched this case and examined it for so many years. How significant is today's operation to exhume the remains of the Somerton man? I think it's fantastic and it's a, a great credit to the South Australian police to have uh, put this through and taken this initiative and uh, I think it's, um, it's a good pathway to solving this mystery finally. Yeah, what are police hoping to find? Um, uh, I guess uh, the key element will be to be able to extract DNA from bone and from that DNA uh, make an identification and find out who the man was. Do you think that's going to be possible given this happened in 1948? There have been very tricky cases, uh, probably of the same level of difficulty in America and so we do know this kind of thing is possible already. Why do you think this case has gone unsolved for so long? Was it because evidence had been destroyed over the years? Um, not really. I think the key thing is that uh, simply no one came forward to identify the man. He didn't seem to have a, a wife, a brother, a sister or a child that came forward and said, hey, this is my long lost uh, relative and no one has ever come forward. So this is actually the issue and why it's been such an enduring mystery. And I guess one of the reasons this case has captured the imagination is not just because his identity remains a mystery, but also because of the curiousness of the circumstances. So all of his clothes were American made, but the labels had been removed. The last page of a Persian poem he had on him and the rest of the book uh, was found in his car and contained a code. I mean, do you think he was a spy? That's been one of the big questions. Um, you know, I, I don't personally think anything. I just am agnostic and uh, about it all. <laughs> and to let the evidence speak for itself. You know, any, uh, but anything's possible, uh, even that scenario. But it's a question of what's probable. And you can explain anything with the spy, with the spy hypothesis. So when one's looking for a different, uh, for a working hypothesis, you tend to not to choose that one as a scientist. But who knows? Uh, there's so many strange twists and turn, turns in this case that nothing surprises me anymore, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> was he poisoned? And is there any way to know if he was or not? Um, we don't know. Uh, the autopsy uh, back in 1948 was inconclusive about the question of poisoning and whether we can establish that now is doubtful given the passage of time. If it was an organic poison it will be dissipated by now. If it was like an element like arsenic or something you would have thought they would know how to detect that in 1948. So um, I would say the chances of uh, finding a poison is quite slim. You said um, you remain agnostic as to whether he was a spy or not. What do you think happened? Uh, I try not to speculate. It's, uh, <laughs> but if you put a gun to my head, uh, I would. I wouldn't think, just just uh, to be clear. I would go for the most boring, boring hypothesis, which might be that he's. Uh, he was probably involved in something like the World War II black market trade and that could explain why none of his associates would want to come forward. So what happens next in this investigation and do you think this case will be solved? Um, well, I guess that the next step is for DNA to be extracted from bone and to find uh, and to get a DNA sequence 
and to compare it with uh, uh, people on genealogical databases and find his nearest cousins and then from those cousins triangulate their family trees to find out who he was. So that, that would be the ideal uh, way forward to identifying him. Sorry, what was your other question? Um, do you think the case will be solved? Uh, yes, I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be solved. We will get his identity. The only fly in the ointment, in my opinion, that could stop it is if the man was originally adopted. If he was adopted out, we can find his probably his original family, but that doesn't say anything about the name he went by in everyday life. Uh, so we'd never be able to find anything out about him other than his original birth family. Uh, so that that could be a possible showstopper, but we'll see. You, you never know till you do it. Yeah, it's a fascinating case. Professor Derek Abbott, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Pleasure. Here are the top stories on ABC News. The opposition and the Greens have criticised the government's underwriting of a new gas-fired power station. The Commonwealth will spend up to $600 million on the new facility at Curry Curry in the New South Wales Hunter region to replace the Liddell coal-fired power plant. Some energy analysts have argued it's not necessary and won't reduce power bills. The federal government says a record 95,000 people have received COVID-19 vaccines in the last 24 hours. The health department says more than 3.2 million doses of the vaccine have been administered in Australia in the last three months. Greg Hunt, the health minister, says the figures show confidence in the rollout is growing. Over a week of fighting between Israel and Palestinian militants in the Gaza region shows no sign of abating. Israeli airstrikes and Hamas rocket attacks on Israel have continued, with more than 200 people on both sides killed in the past nine days. International calls for a ceasefire have been unsuccessful. And India's daily coronavirus death toll has risen by a record 4,529. It's the largest death toll in a single day from one country since the pandemic began. India also reported nearly 270,000 new infections in the last day. To breaking news, the ABC has confirmed...